Your Excellencies, dear Ambassador of Israel, Mr. Shmuel Revel, dear Ambassador of Greece, Mr. Theoharis Lagos, dear Director of the Energy and Marine Policy Division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Yorgos Christofidis. I would like to welcome you all to this live session of the MC 2020 video postcard series. These last few months have been extraordinary. The multidimensional crisis caused by COVID-19 seems to be leading to sweeping changes at various levels. Already, several analysts are talking about a paradigm shift, both in relation to the political, economic, and social systems, as well as in international relations. It is within this context that we will have the discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on bilateral and trilateral relations in the Eastern Mediterranean. My colleague, Yannos Katsuridis, and I will be raising some questions and issues that you will be addressing. I think if we have brief comments about no more than three minutes on each issue raised, we will be in a position to address several themes. The first question and issue revolves around the impact of COVID-19 in the region and in the international environment. There are two distinct views. Some people talk about sweeping changes uh, amounting to a paradigm shift and others uh, would say that it's just uh, there would be changes, there would be a transformation, but there would be continuity. I would like your response and comments and perspectives on that. I start with the Ambassador of Israel, Mr. Revel. Yes. Uh, well, we have a statement in Israel that says uh, that, uh, you know, sometimes you shouldn't measure the temperature inside a cup of tea because that doesn't give you the right uh, temperature that you actually have in your environment. And now we are in, a, you can say in a cup of tea in the sense that uh, the COVID-19 is still with us and uh, we are still facing the challenge very much uh, in uh, the region, in many countries. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to make predictions, but what we can only already learn from uh, what we have passed in the last uh, three months, four months, which have really been uh, without precedent, is that uh, first and foremost, uh, we have neglected probably to pay attention to something which is very important, which is the need to uh, address when we build the global system, and we, if we talk about the global world, but also when we build our regional uh, infrastructure, uh, we should also pay very close attention when we build the relations between the countries to how we can better monitor uh, emergency situations, especially health emergency situations. And this is, for me, obviously the first lesson. We should do much better. And this is the first impact that I think will be on uh, the neighborhood that we live in, we don't have enough synergy between the countries on uh, emergency situations, we don't have enough synergies on monitoring health epidemics, and we should do that very quickly. Another impact that we can already foresee is the economic impact. Uh, of course, uh, some of the countries in the region uh, are better than others, but generally, uh, the economic impact is going to significantly impact many of the countries in the region. Um, if Israel looks around it, I'm looking as the ambassador of Israel at the countries around Israel, we can see several countries which have already gone into the conflict, uh, into, the, uh, into the epidemic with uh, either conflicts, internal conflicts, also with a very dire economic situation, very difficult one, which is causing unrest and instability. And certainly now with the uh, epidemic, this will, uh, with the pandemic, this will even uh, make the situation even more challenging for these countries. And this certainly uh, has an impact already on the stability uh, of our region. Thank you. The ambassador of Greece, Mr. Lagos. Hello, and thank you for uh, hosting me here at your panel to, uh, tonight. Uh, about COVID-19, it's a pandemic, and it showed that we really live in a globalized world. 
uh, people around the world may like or dislike the notion of globalization, but it's with us and we cannot avoid it as this uh, pandemic showed. Pandemic, pan, comes from ancient Greek. It means whole. No one is immune. No one can, be, can stay out of it. There can be lags in timing and intensity. Uh, our countries, the countries represented at this panel, uh, were very successful in tackling uh, the worst uh, consequences of, uh, of this new threat. But nobody is immune. Now, as to the consequences in the short and medium run, uh, I think that on one level, there may not be a lot of change in the long run because this was something that affected the entire region, but also the entire world. It was not localized to one country or a few countries or just a cluster of countries. So everybody is more or less on the same boat. So more or less, again, everybody got into the pandemic and the limitations of it and the disadvantages. And again, by and large, every country will come out of it, hopefully soon, uh, around the same time. Now, as to some more permanent fixtures that this unprecedented experience brought to us, uh, I've read many views, uh, especially by scholars, international scholars from around the world. And personally, I tend to agree with those who uh, submit that the uh, pandemic is not going to alter the system of international relations or the course of events in the long run. However, it may accentuate and even accelerate certain changes that were already taking place, that were already in the making. For example, the return to a multipolar world, to a world where there is no one single superpower, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Mr. Alakros. Mr. Christovidis. Thank you, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, um, uh, to take part in this discussion. Um, as a first comment, I think I would agree with the Ambassador of Israel about the saying that he just said. I think it's uh, really too soon to take the temperature when uh, in the cup of tea. Uh, nevertheless, I would say that there are some conclusions that we can already draw uh, from this pandemic. First, of course, that the first instinct, instinct of the countries, not only in the region, but internationally, was this strict lockdown measures that we all had to take. Uh, and, uh, the flip side of this, uh, of the coin, is that uh, uh, these measures uh, underlined um, and uh, that how interconnected the whole world is. It's not the, the Greek ambassador just said it, it's not a matter of the region, it's uh, the whole world. And this highlighted also the, the first step of each country that looked into the their neighbors and partners, I would say, uh, for the first immediate defense against this pandemic. And I would say, uh, for example, for Cyprus, this um, uh, instinct of turning to uh, friends and allies in the region uh, and the EU, for example, Cyprus with Israel, Greece, and the EU, uh, which we are very grateful, um, is a first sign of uh, where countries um, uh, would turn in times of need. The second conclusion, in my opinion, is also that uh, the world will not change. Uh, it, it's not going to be uh, the interconnection of the world and the globalization will not change, in my opinion. Uh, it might uh, underline, I think, uh, maybe in terms of the international um, cooperation or, or even regional cooperation, um, uh, the need for prioritization of the issues to be addressed and not uh, overstretch on other issues. Uh, but final conclusion, I would say that it's too early to say if there is going to be a permanent change to how we uh, have uh, cooperated either in the region or internationally until now. Thank you, Mr. Christovilis. Yannos. Uh, before shifting the focus to another area, uh, I would like to follow up a bit on the 
post-COVID environment uh, in relation <coughs> to what Mr. Theofanos, Professor Theofanos has already spoken about for a possible paradigm shift. Although you have all hinted that this is not something that you expect, there are a number of analyses that uh, put into question the role of uh, the nation state, whether it is uh, acquiring back some of its strengths. This has been uh, a lot of discussion on this issue within the European Union, particularly in the first uh, stages of this pandemic. And I was wondering more precisely whether you think that the nation state is returning in the international arena as a sole actor, mostly uh, as opposed to uh, schemes of uh, multilateral or trilateral cooperation. And in the same sense, uh, what, what, uh, whether do you think that the role of the state in economy is changing? We have been witnessing for many years now uh, a more neoliberal approach into economics with the state uh, being out of the economy. Now a lot of people are arguing that the state should return. Do you think that the role of the nation state is returning not only international, in international relations, but also in the economy? Uh, I would, I would follow the same order as uh, uh, Professor Theofanos did with the uh, uh, ambassador of Israel going first. Um, my conclusion is a little different. Uh, I agree with you that the answer that the nation states gave to the pandemic um, is fundamental, is very important, and it has been shown uh, that those countries which answered quickly also, at the end, they got better results. Uh, and with all due caution, I think we can uh, say today that uh, countries like Israel and Greece and Cyprus that are here represented today answered very quickly. The governments uh, really answered to the challenge and uh, managed to, until now, uh, face a pandemic with success. Um, just the same. I would like to add to this another layer, which uh, for me today is even, is even more obvious, is that we need to enhance our, and I referred to it before, our sub-regional cooperation, especially with the like-minded countries in our immediate neighborhood. Um, certainly it's true when you were talking about Israel, Cyprus, and Greece. Uh, I will practice my Greece, uh, Greek a little bit here. Uh, and say that simera perisotero apopote preti naima ste conta idio mas chores o itria mas chores I can say um, or to quote even to be more more challenging I will quote the ancient Greek storyteller Isopos uh, bear with me he said ima ste zinati otan ima ste enomeni I hope I said it correctly enomeni yeah. Okay, so uh, going back to, to what I said, Israel, Cyprus, Greece, uh, very quickly, already also after the uh, pandemic broke out, created channels. I can talk for myself as Israeli ambassador here. Uh, we were in contact, for example, with the op hospital in um, uh, Famagusta, also with the uh, emergency clinic in the Nicosia hospital, in the emergency care unit in the Egypt, and we put them in contact with the biggest uh, um, uh, COVID-19 center in Israel, the Sheba Medical Center, and the doctors started working together because both the doctors in Israel and in Cyprus were facing an unknown virus, and it was much better for them to exchange information about treatment of patients, which drugs we should use. And this is ongoing even today, because even today you can hear doctors still consulting each other. Should we give this patient this med medication? Should we do this? Should we do something else? So immediately this contact between the doctors uh, is very, very important. Then also the transfer of um, pharmaceuticals. Not all countries have all the pharmaceuticals on their shelf. So between Israel and Cyprus, we managed to exchange pharmaceuticals when it was needed. Uh, also, evacuating emergency cases. In some cases, when there is a need, you need to evacuate a patient to another country, for example, from Cyprus to Israel. And we did this on numerous cases. So I don't think that one country can just be an island and deal with it on its own. It has to create, especially with those around it, with those that are like-minded, very strong bridges 
that will allow it to move forward. And not to be too long, I will say that also when we're looking at the exit strategy, uh, when we're talking, for example, about renewal of flights, about renewal of tourism, again, again we are looking at the countries around us for the economic, economic recovery. So we cannot be an island. Uh, we are all little islands, but at the end of the day, we have to also uh, link up and be, as, as I said, stronger together. Mr. Lagos? Well, on the question of uh, the impact of the uh, pandemic on the nation state, I think that uh, as an international actor, uh, the uh, nation state will never cease to be at the very center of developments. There may be some you know, relative ups and downs as to its central importance vis-a-vis uh, -vis other uh, parallel developments, such as attempts for uh, federalization or closer regional integration. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that uh, the impact of uh, the national policies uh, is something that we saw being accentuated during the uh, crisis, during this pandemic. Uh, for instance, even within the European Union, which uh, has made a lot of significant progress in um, homogenizing policies in uh, different sectors. When it came to measures on how to curb the spread of the virus, we saw that different uh, states, different national states within the European Union uh, chose significantly different uh, measures in, uh, uh, in terms of timing, in terms of intensity, and also as we are exiting the most difficult phase of the pandemic, again, we see that the uh, national states uh, put their national interest first when it comes, just to give you one example, to measures or to timetables on how to enter the tourist season, especially countries which rely a lot on tourism. So I think that the uh, pandemic has also uh, exhibited that uh, there will be perhaps uh, across the board a return to a more state intervention uh, to the uh, social area in each country, in each society. Uh, we saw that uh, in all countries really, uh, when things got to, uh, to the critical level, you had to rely on national health structures, on state-run hospitals, even in countries where uh, private uh, medicine is uh, at the forefront and uh, state medicine is not supported really a lot. Uh, we have seen changes. I don't know if uh, those will persist, but uh, again, uh, maybe it's the beginning of a new phase uh, as to uh, how different states view uh, priorities, uh, which may start from the area of health, of uh, public health, uh, but they have implications, as we saw, on every other aspect of our life uh, and foremost on the economy. The Christophidis. Uh, thank you. I, I think I agree with Janos uh, Katsuturidis, where he said about um, the second part of his question regarding the nation state or the state vis-a-vis -vis citizens. I think all of us, we, uh, we realized at the moment of the, the COVID-19, when we realized how, in, how serious it was, everybody, it was natural, I think, for all the citizens to turn to the state as the, not only as the health provider, or, but the safety and the security that one feels when uh, you have a state that takes uh, all three countries represented today here are successful. I touch wood about this, but because they acted very quickly, uh, and it was the, the, this capacity of the state to uh, enforce uh, to enforce the measures uh, very quickly uh, gave also the, uh, the, the the impression of safety and security 
and taking care of the health. Another aspect also, it was again, vis-a-vis -vis the citizens, it was the, the economic impact. It was the weight of the state that came for the welfare of the citizens, uh, providing uh, resources uh, for the private sector also. They all turned to the state in order to safeguard uh, uh, employment, uh, jobs uh, at the end of the day. So it was only natural, in my opinion, to have this kind of um, uh, the people turning to the state for uh, security. Um, on the other hand, it will not, in my opinion, erase the need for international cooperation, even in the health uh, area. For example, uh, Ambassador of Israel just mentioned the bilateral exchanges, even of um, pharmaceuticals, um, um, uh, data about the patients because it was an unknown. But look at what's happening internationally with the financing uh, <clears throat> of um, efforts in various countries of the world, not only in the region, but in general internationally for finding the vaccine. Um, uh, billions are spent from one uh, part of the world to the, the other, um, exchanging data, but also contributing to the, uh, to have a safe uh, vaccine at the end of the day. And this again highlights, in my opinion, the, the, the fact that the inter international cooperation cannot really be erased. Uh, and, uh, no state, uh, nation um, uh, can be so imperious, I would say, as acting alone or an island, uh, being an island in the international community. If I may say, um, enhanced role of a state or of the state does not mean that it will be an island or it, it, it in regional international cooperation are part of, of uh, our world today and it will continue to be. The state may have an enhanced role to advance those objectives. Well, now let me turn to another question and uh, I would like to reverse the order. I would ask first Mr. Christovidis because I would start with the role of Turkey. With COVID or without COVID, Turkey is there uh, mm -hmm. and enhancing its activities uh, in the area. It has an assertive role. Uh, its rhetoric uh, and so on, people talking about uh, that it may be destabilizing. This is um, in relation to its perspectives on exclusive economic zones and pipelines. Um, the question is that this assertiveness uh, can be contained. Um, and of course, Cyprus cannot contain it by itself. The ambassador of Israel said, uh, if we are united, uh, we will be stronger. I certainly agree. They would like to have this implemented uh, in the broader area. But I will start with Mr. Christofidis this time. Uh, <clears throat> Professor, uh, you are absolutely right about uh, Turkey's role. I think it was my minister in one of the meetings who said um, that the only thing that is immune to COVID-19 is Turkey's illegality. Uh, I would also add that it's the only country in the world that they didn't apply not social distancing, but national distancing, keep it to their borders. Turkey's role, especially in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, they started another illegal drilling uh, operation in Cyprus CZ, uh, and it is not only that, it, this is the sixth uh, within a year. Um, you can see its role in uh, Syria, um, uh, Cyprus, of course, Greece, and Libya with the MOU that uh, signed with the uh, Saraj government. Um, there is no question that this is not only assertive, but it's uh, out of uh, the well accepted. Destabilizing. I have used the word destabilizing. I think more than that, really. I think the energy uh, issue, I mean, drillings, seismic uh, surveys, and all that. It's not uh, only, uh, there are some commentators that they think that uh, Turkey is just looking for gas. It's a big country, they need, this is, not, this is not the case in our opinion. Our reading is that this destabilizing effect has in its roots a, a revisionist, a revisionist uh, policy in the region. Um, uh, and they are using every force they have, all the military power and the militarization of the, uh, of the issues. Uh, the, uh, 
the latest, I think, uh, and, but the Greek ambassador, I'm sure he will refer to that, uh, provocations with the publication of uh, the interest of TPAO um, in areas just outside the Greek islands um, uh, show exactly what, uh, what we're saying for so long. Now, can it be contained? I think that's the uh, million dollar question. Certainly, uh, the answer is not a military one. Uh, nobody really wants uh, a, a militarization of the situation. Even though Turkey does everything in its power to uh, put on the agenda exactly this aspect, the, the use of force and the threats of use of force and the militarization with the unbelievable, an unbelievable number of military exercises in all Eastern Mediterranean um, and many other uh, initiatives they have taken, especially with Libya lately. Uh, we, do not we cannot change geography, that's for sure. We cannot, as Cyprus alone, uh, confront militarily um, uh, Turkey. And this is not the, this is not the, the aim here. Right? It's a, a Cyprus and other uh, like-minded countries, uh, but I will leave the, the other speakers um, speak for themselves. We have the international law as our only weapon uh, to confront Turkey and uh, show to the world that exactly, I, I, I see you are nodding. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm smiling so, because I'm international, smiling. international law in the United Nations I mean, Cypriots uh, had uh, very high expectations. It's an important tool, but at the same time, we cannot ignore other factors. At the end of the day, if the balance or the if the imbalance of power, yeah, you know, is enhanced, then we will be more in trouble. And if we want to have peace, uh, the other the player which does not inter uh, respect international law must think twice. Be before it, it attempts anything. So I think at some point in time, in addition to international law and wishful thinking, we must see realities. Okay, I, there, there are, can I just uh, Yes. There are other of legal, political, diplomatic tools used in order to uh, create cost to Turkey um, uh, when it uh, continues to act like it acts today. For example, we have said before, uh, by, by saying international law, first of all, we, uh, we of course have the agreements between us, the bilateral agreements of delimitation. We have agreements for many other projects in the region, uh, but also within the European Union. I think it's, uh, we should not underestimate the, um, the value of the sanctions regime that was established against uh, Turkey and uh, two TPAO officials are already listed on that uh, sanctions regime. And uh, we would like very much to continue with, uh, the EU should continue, we think, uh, with a proportionate response to every illegal action that Turkey does in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, uh, I will not get into the, the legalities of what Turkey does and that, uh, what we do. But I think it was uh, an ex uh, undersecretary of the United States who said about the international law that Turkey is the minority of one when we talk about this. And that is reflected. This is reflected uh, very well in the regional cooperation we have within the EU, the, the importance of having sanctions against Turkey. And at the end of the day, it's not only the, the, the legal regime that was established, it's the political measures that were taken as a response to Turkey's uh, illegal drillings, um, uh, cutting of the funding, uh, suspension of the political dialogue, all that create an environment of Turkey that they can say whatever they want about how isolated they are, but this is a, a self-isolation, self-imposed isolation on Turkey that does not participate with any other mechanism of cooperation within the Eastern Mediterranean. That has a cost, but can it be contained? Is that enough? I would say no. But at the same time, let's not underestimate the value of all these diplomatic, political, legal initiatives that have been undertaken uh, by the government. We certainly appreciate. We certainly appreciate it. We don't underestimate, but we should not overestimate. I'm not talking about you, yes. <laughs> I'm okay. thinking about you know. Sometimes, yes. If you, you talk about the, the average Cypriot. Let's be honest. Okay, they expect much more from various. I, we understand the difficulties. Yes.
here. Uh, let me now turn to the ambassador of Greece about this issue about the uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I think you are muted. Mr. Lelakos? Yes, okay, yes. thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes, we hear you. I can, I can hear you, yes. Yes, okay. About this role, about the same question about the, the assertive, destabilizing role of Turkey. I understand the political tools are very important, but at the end of the day, uh, how can Turkey be contained? Or not to use the term contained, how can it be stopped? so that it does not infringe on the, on the national sovereignty of the Republic of Cyprus and the national sovereignty of Greece. Andreas, if I may add a small thing on that uh, for the ambassadors to comment, whether we are expecting any uh, escalation of uh, this aggressiveness in the forthcoming weeks or months. Uh, it's, there have been talks about this, particularly with the exclusive economic zone uh, in Crete Island or uh, in another Greek islands. Are we expecting something on this front? Well, in his response, uh, Georgos Christofidis used the term revisionist. And this is where I would like to begin my uh, reply to your question. For you know, quite some time now, Turkey is uh, consciously and deliberately and methodically following a revisionist policy, uh, certainly at the, at the regional level, but uh, I would also uh, say more uh, than that. Uh, by revisionist, I mean that Turkey is actively trying to change the status quo in uh, our neighborhood first and then uh, uh, further away. And this is not a new development. This is not something that is uh, characteristic of uh, President Erdogan only. This is a picture of Turkish policy for decades now, and we don't need to go very far to see the proof of this. Uh, Turkey actually changed the status quo in Cyprus in 1974, and this change has not been reversed yet. Uh, despite the international condemnation, and the isolation of uh, Turkey in, uh, in, in many, many areas, including the recognition of the so-called Republic of the North. Uh, more than that, uh, lately, uh, and certainly uh, more so with uh, under Erdogan, uh, Ankara is uh, following, is having pretensions for global prominence, which leads Turkey to assume policies which go beyond the uh, narrow region, the narrow neighborhood, and uh, uh, proceed to actions which uh, are very, very destabilizing, uh, not only for the immediate neighbors. Uh, for instance, armaments. Uh, the armaments uh, race in which Turkey has embarked is something that uh, cannot be seen only in the context of its quest of regional supremacy. Uh, they need more than that. And this is perhaps very, very alarming. And I think that more and more international actors see this and to take this into account or are beginning to do so. Uh, can this be contained? Again, I believe that Turkey will be contained only when they realize that the cost of continuing to follow this expansionist revisionist policy uh, will be uh, much greater than uh, the benefits that they reap from it. And in order to have that, we need to have a very strong cooperation, not only at the regional level. Uh, this cooperation should be uh, broader even broader than the European level, it will have to be at the global level. It will have to uh, involve big global powers, which I'm not going to name now, uh, but I think you understand. Now, I'm not talking about military alliances against Turkey or a, you know, an international crusade by military needs against Turkey. This is unrealistic and this is not desirable. 
certainly not by Greeks. And I will agree again with Yorgos on this. Uh, what we need to do though, is to have assertive action ourselves against Turkey in areas which are proportionate to what they are doing and uh, with measures which will be felt by Turkey. Again, not military, not aggressive, but measures which cannot be disregarded by uh, the authorities of Ankara and measures which are fully justified uh, uh, in the light of what they have already done uh, around Cyprus and uh, in and around Cyprus and what they are pretending to do uh, in the uh, case of Greece and perhaps other areas uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. To clarify what I'm talking about, I use one word, sanctions. International sanctions or national sanctions by important states targeted against certain entities like the TPAO as sanctions uh, in, uh, in response to uh, illegal drilling uh, on the uh, Cypriot continental shelf, uh, or uh, they planned uh, drilling in other areas, perhaps close, very close to Greece and uh, you know, the islands of Crete and Rhodes, etc. Thank you. Now, uh, oh yes, uh, we also we also have the additional question about possible escalation. Again, I would think that we will have escalation if Turkey is led to believe by the uh, inability of the international community to send a very strong and tangible message that yes, they can escalate with impunity. And they will do that. If they feel that there is impunity there, they will do it. So in order to avoid escalation, we'll have to be firm, we'll have to, to build stronger alliances. Again, not military alliances, alliances against Turkey, but alliances which will uh, bring the message clearly to Ankara, to the government there, that they cannot proceed on this course. You know, that the international community is firmly opposed to it. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I now turn to the Ambassador of Israel. Yes, um, it's, very, it's a very important uh, issue and um, was discussed yesterday. Uh, there was a visit of Prime Minister Mitsotakis, uh, in, of Prime Minister of Greece in Israel, and next week they, there is a planned visit of the President of Cyprus in Israel. Actually, if we're talking about the COVID-19, for both leaders, the Prime Minister of Greece and for the President of Cyprus, these are the first uh, uh, trips abroad uh, after following the outbreak of the pandemic. So it's a very strong uh, strategic symbol, but also a very strong uh, a symbol about the strength of our relationship uh, with uh, Greece and Cyprus. Um, regarding Turkey, these are issues are discussed among the leaders, and uh, I assume that you've seen the uh, uh, press statement that was uh, issued yesterday after the meeting of uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu with Prime Minister Mitsotakis. It clearly expressed the fact that uh, we call for the respect of the sovereign rights uh, of, Israel, of Cyprus and Greece uh, in their um, uh, continental shelf, but also in their exclusive economic zone, and that we uh, reject, strongly oppose any attempt to oppose these rights, which might destabilize the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, region. Um, and uh, this is a clear policy of uh, Israel. Uh, we must follow these events very closely, and we, we do f follow them with a lot of concern. And uh, we've repeatedly said so in the uh, last few months, uh, especially uh, also uh, regarding the latest uh, drillings of Turkey in the EEZ of, of Cyprus. This is something clear. Uh, but I think we have to attach it also to something else. And uh, there was a question before about um, uh, the uh, nation state. And um, let me, I think for the sake of this argument, since we are after all dealing in a more maybe deeper understanding of the situation, um, we have to sometimes zoom out a little bit and see that in our region, 
there, there's been a process, and it hasn't started today, it started already in 2010, of destabilizing nation states. And uh, if we look at Yemen, if we look at Syria, at Lebanon, also at Libya, you see uh, internal strife, the lack of a nation state, and this vacuum has been used by uh, powers to maybe extend their influence and their ideologies. Uh, in that sense, I think particularly about Iran, which you know for Israel is a major threat. If we talk for one moment, and again, I'm zooming out about the Iranian threat, it is also destabilizing the Eastern Mediterranean region by the simple fact that uh, Iran has a very radical regime, ideological radical regime. It is manufacturing nuclear weapons, it is uh, exp exporting its terrorism, and it is presenting its present, it's exporting its present into Syria and Lebanon and uh, to the Hezbollah. So the, 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 the situation in the region is very complex. We cannot just minimize it to one phenomena is that is in our narrow lens. We have to look at the f overall situation, which makes it also very complex to solve the situation. I join uh, the ambassador of Greece and also uh, my good friend, uh, Justice Tufides from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, that, uh, you know, we need also to look, it's not just Israel, Cyprus, Greece, which are on the screen at the moment, but the national community, certainly when it comes to Iran, uh, this is, as I said, not <laughs> expect much more stronger pressure. Of course, there is the American pressure, but we would like to see also stronger European pressure and uh, that uh, there has to be uh, a stance by the international community to tell Iran to stop its activities in the region. Thank you. Janus, you want to pause? Yeah. Or, uh, or, or, or we have the questions from the audience. Uh, I would like to pose a last question because I realize the, uh, the time limit and shift the focus to the energy sector. I was just going to ask Andreas uh, about the East Med pipeline. It's been the nucleus of uh, this trilateral cooperation between the three countries. And uh, I was wondering uh, how is this project moving uh, forward? Because we have seen a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but we have seen objections on this uh, East Met regarding its uh, technical and financial viability. Uh, and I was wondering how we are moving forward with this project. Um, uh, Yorgos, you want to start? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll come to that. Can I just comment on uh, what uh, Ambassador of Israel just said, uh, my good friend uh, Sami, um, about the complexities of the region? He's absolutely right. I just wanted to flag out that, especially when there is destabilization of, uh, of a whole region in various um, parts of the Eastern Mediterranean, let's say one can only uh, think of how the situation today, and zooming out, I would say just one thing about Turkey, Ambassador, who, um, uh, since we are talking about uh, this, I just saw yesterday uh, Mr. Tsavusoglu welcoming the foreign minister of Iran in Ankara. And if you go through the tweet he made, it's very interesting to see these two calling each other brothers, uh, but also Mr. Tsavusoglu, um, uh, saying that we are with Iran against the unilateral sanctions that have been taken against our brothers. Just this is a small parenthesis about how gaps can be used by various actors like Ankara and Tur Turkey in general um, in various parts of the Middle East uh, and the Eastern Mediterranean. Coming to your question, Janos, is very interesting because this is a very hot issue about the Eastern Mediterranean pipeline and all that. Um, I, I saw yesterday the, the Prime Minister Mitsotakis visit uh, the joint communicate between the two Prime Ministers of Greece and Israel, again um, uh, expressing the commitment to proceed with this, uh, uh, to this project. There is no question that uh, this is a strategically important project. Uh, we are not at the, at the stage of acting upon it in terms of financing it or uh, uh, you know, there are finan uh, studies about the uh, viability, the financial and technical viability being undertaken now. Money have been spent from the European Union uh, towards these studies. Um, 
no governments at, at the stage of you know uh, giving the licenses to uh, put the cables, the, uh, not the cable, the, the pipeline itself uh, underwater. We're not there yet, but it's too early again to say that this is a project that can be viable or just a pipe dream, uh, like has been uh, call, uh, called uh, many times here in Cyprus, as you know, as you know better. This is uh, strategically, uh, politically, and I would add legally also important project because you have three countries. Um, Greece has already ratified the, the easement uh, agreement, easement pipeline agreement, and Cyprus will soon, hopefully, even before uh, President Anastasia travels to Israel next week. I'm not sure this is uh, the job and the, the, on the agenda of the parliament here in Cyprus. But again, for us, it's, uh, you had three countries and Italy might join later. You know, the political problems, internal problems about the end of the pipeline, where it would go and prevented Italy from signing it. But you have three countries that agreed in a legal text that will be ratified by the three countries, um, um, uh, having, giving the legal framework for the project to take place. These are examples of the diplomacy and the projects that can be done with um, the countries of the region. It's not only the Eastman pipeline, it's the Eurasia interconnector for the, uh, connecting the three countries' electric grids. These are very important projects that uh, highlight uh, exactly this trilateral cooperation we all have. And at the end of the day, connecting you know, the dots here about energy and the trilateral cooperation, uh, in my opinion, it was the, the energy was the driving force behind this uh, trilateral um, cooperation between the three countries and other countries of the region, um, uh, but which went well further than energy now um, uh, with other uh, areas of cooperation. But if we stick to the energy, uh, energy issue and the energy area, you have seen how energy has helped the creation for the EMGF, for example, the forum in Egypt, where you have this um, uh, surprisingly uh, good development of having uh, six, seven countries of the region uh, there um, uh, discussing energy. Hopefully at some point we will have the signing of the, uh, of the um, uh, statute of the, of the forum. Um, these are the initiatives that you know, give value to this cooperation in the region, having at the back of our minds the, um, uh, that the cooperation, it will benefit the, the citizens at the end of the day of our countries. Okay, time is pressing. I have, uh, uh, I received three questions that I will pose uh, before we close. Now, uh, to the ambassador of Greece, how do you assess the recent meeting of the EU uh, Foreign Affairs, the Council of Foreign Affairs with the participation of the US Secretary of State? assessment of that. Second, to Mr. Christofidis uh, about, can we use the tools provided by the International Court of Justice in relation to Turkish violations? Can that be used? And to all of you, um, how do you envision the future of the trilateral cooperation be between our countries? Your goes, yes, you may start. I yes. can start. Yes. Yeah, but yes. the International Court of Justice, we have uh, said many times, we have publicly invited Turkey for uh, negotiation for the limitation of uh, the maritime zones uh, between us. Uh, um, officially, we have invited them. The European Union has welcomed this invitation, but this is for uh, a negotiation uh, with Turkey. Uh, Turkey, you know the answer. They don't recognize Cyprus. They will not get into the, uh, this kind of uh, discussion and negotiation, which, mind you, Professor, this is the only way to delimit maritime zones. I think the Greek ambassador... Can perhaps, perhaps that could take place if other countries um, push in that direction, including Greece and Egypt and Israel, of course. I mean, yeah. if, it is, if it is a bilateral a multilateral effort, it will have more weight, I think. 
Yes, but at the end of the day, with Cyprus, there is also the, um, uh, the issue of recognition. I understand, but yes. that, that... But I will come to the to to your basic question, the, your uh, our viewers' basic question about the court or uh, Cyprus having as its flag, let's say, um, uh, promoting international law and feeling very comfortable with our legal positions about the maritime zones of Cyprus has also invited Turkey which if you can uh, if you follow very closely what they are saying they also argue that they act on the basis of international law we have many times told them that okay you say you are saying no to the um, negotiations for delimitation but let's take our difference to the international court of justice as you know turkey does not accept the uh, compulsory jurisdiction of the court in, in the hague um, uh, but of course, we have said that we are ready to submit. Um, uh, there is a process for, for doing that um, called forum prorogatum, that you go to the court essentially, and we, uh, at, at some point, we will do that, um, uh, putting there your legal positions regarding our EEZ and the, whatever dispute Turkey has regarding the west uh, and north of Cyprus. Um, they refuse, Turkey refuses, so that, that um, to, to come and uh, uh, sign, a spe uh, it's called um, Compromis Special, to take the, our, okay. Okay. The, uh, our dispute uh, to the court. Regret Point, made. Yeah. Point made. In relation to the future of the trilateral cooperation between our countries? Um, I think it's very bright. I think that what the Ambassador of Israel just mentioned, I think that even this discussion is very timely. It's just one day after the Greek Prime Minister visited uh, Israel as his first uh, trip abroad, and our president is going together with four ministers uh, to Israel next week on the 23rd. Uh, um, uh, I think it's, I'm very optimistic about the, the prospect of the, of the trilateral uh, with Israel and Greece. Um, uh, and I think this symbolic visit as the first country for our president to visit um, uh, speaks volumes uh, of itself, uh, I think, for the depth, I would say, of our cooperation with Israel and, of course, Greece. Thank you, Mr. Dallacos. Uh, on both issues, uh, on both issues, trilateral uh, cooperation and then the EU-US. Uh, Professor, give me one minute because I want to say a couple of things about the East Med very, very briefly. One, as uh, we saw only yesterday and today even, the visit of Prime Minister Mitsotakis to Israel uh, gave a chance to the leaders of the two countries to reiterate the uh, central importance that this project has for both countries and for the region. So I just have to stress this. It's uh, the East Med was and continues to be a cornerstone of our uh, energy planning. It's also a very central issue in the very successful cooperation that we managed to establish quite recently between the three states represented here, Greece, Cyprus, and Israel, and the United States, the three plus one uh, project, which deals a lot uh, with priority, with energy. So, and it has given, it has lent all its political support to the East Med uh, pipeline project. Now, about the complexities and about the cost of building such a pipeline, we are all aware of this. We know it's going to be expensive, we know it's going to be complex, and we know it's going to take some time if we, uh, from the time we uh, embark upon the construction of it. However, it's uh, contrary to what certain energy experts like to stress that it's ultimately the cost or the market which determines pipelines, which will be built and which will be abandoned. Well, my view is a little bit different. And I, if I had more time, I would bring you know, uh, very concrete examples. But there are two key issues that are also at play here. One is energy diversification and also pipeline diversification. And the other issue is what they call energy security. If we want to have energy security for Europe, for our region, but also you know, for the continent of Europe, then we need ambitious projects like this. 
No, no. On the question about the uh, recent meeting between the uh, EU ministers and uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, uh, I think, first of all, it's important that this meeting took place at the time when the US administration is openly not very friendly, to put it this way, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the European Union. I think that the meeting, uh, the fact that the meeting took place is very important in itself. Second, I think it's also very important that Turkey was one of the key topics that was discussed between the European ministers and the Secretary of State. It was not the only topic, but it was a key topic. And as to the outcome, as to the results, I think that the nature of the discussions on Turkey among the Europeans, but also between Europeans and Americans are sensitive enough not to allow for you know, concrete immediate reactions to be relayed to the public. But I think that it's a positive development. And what I know for a fact, and I worked uh, very closely on that with, uh, uh, during my previous assignment to the United States, uh, Greece, at least, works very closely with the United States on a number of issues, including regional issues in the Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Mr. Revel, last but not least, certainly. Thank you very much. Um, on the trilateral, definitely, um, uh, I've stated several times in recent times that we are very lucky to have found each other. It took some time, you have to say, but in recent years, two, three years, we found each other. And uh, we have here three democratic countries, Israel, uh, Cyprus, and of course, Greece, a very ancient uh, de democracy. We have three democracies. Our leaders really have a very big amount of trust between them. The ministers work dynamically between them. So I join my friend George Christophe in saying that this really has a very promising future. Um, and it is also beyond the uh, future. Today it's very important because even just the conversation that we had today about all these shared concerns in the region, and it doesn't mean that we all see eye to eye exactly on each situation, but we have shared concern in a region which is very unstable with many pockets of violence, of instability. And the fact that here we have three democracies working for stability, for security, for prosperity, for our own countries, but also for the region. This is something that cannot be taken lightly and uh, is already, I think, getting the results in the region, as was said regarding the ISMED gas forum, for example, in Cairo, and also with other regional initiatives. So definitely this is very important. There are also very big opportunities. We discussed a lot about the challenges today. We didn't have a long time to speak about the opportunities, but certainly when we talk about the ISMED gas pipeline, we believe it's a huge opportunity. There are some facts that you cannot argue with. Uh, we have a lot of natural gas in our region. Israel was lucky to find, but also actually, for example, Energian with the Greek Cyprus company has found significant uh, gas in the EEZ of Israel. And we have Israeli companies working in the EEZ of Cyprus. And so our companies are really synergizing in this uh, gas finds. We have this gas. Europe certainly needs energy, needs also energy security. Uh, so beyond the needs of the region, we can also answer many of the needs for Europe. And this is the idea behind the East Gas, uh, the East Med Gas Pipeline, and also with behind, behind other projects like the Euro-Asia Interconnector and other ideas to connect our region to Europe. This is something that was just could, could be a dream really a few years ago. And today it's turning to be a reality with the full support. And again, through these visits, the full 100% support of our leaders to this project was expressed. And I want to say also, if just to conclude, because we are talking again about COVID-19, there is something very, very important. As our countries are opening up, uh, our prime minister yesterday expressed the fact that in, on the 1st of August, everything rests under, uh, under control. Uh, the first Israeli tourists will be able to fly to Greece and to Cyprus. Uh, so the first connection for the Israelis to the world, again, after the COVID-19, will be with Greece and Cyprus. This is economics, it's symbolic, and it's also, I think, a uh, really big uh, stamp on, of belief in our trilateral cooperation 
and the significant it holds for our future. I thank you very much. I, I must say that this was a very fruitful session. I think we covered several topics. Um, we would be looking forward to hosting you in the conventional way in the university which was here to discuss further issues. Uh, before we close, again, thank you. And the next uh, uh, episode, episode two will be on Monday at about uh, six o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.